And then we've got some other agenda items that we'll go through. Can you use the mic? You need to lean forward to use the mics or move oh, them in front of you. Towards you. Yeah. And then we'll go through Thank you. Um, the other agenda items, which was talking about, you know, the, our policy in ter terms of the 5% that we allocate to um, debt and capital, and then go through minutes. So we will start with the presentation from the school committee. They'll do an overview, and then we can um, ask questions. I know we didn't submit any formal questions, but I know a number of us were here during the regular meetings, and um, a lot of the questions were answered along with very thorough um, questions that the school committee had uh, sent in. We appreciate the copies we received of those responses. So we'll turn it over to the school department. Great. Finally learned. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having us here tonight. We are going to provide a high-level summary of the su um, superintendents, which became the school committee's FY21 <coughs> budget. We're going to be referring to the materials that were sent out, so hopefully everyone has either an electronic copy or a hard copy of the budget book, but I'll refer to specific tables and pages within the book to refer to. Um, the school committee budget was presented over five nights, starting with an overview back on December 19th, where we walked the community through the budget process, the makeup of the budget, the cost centers, what makes them up, the various grants and revolving funds and whatnot. So we started our process actually mid-December. We then followed that by four nights in January, which included the public hearing on January 23rd. The school committee unanimous, unanimously voted to approve the budget on January 27th, and for those who did attend the meetings, the budget was approved as it was presented. We went through all of the items, presented all the cost centers, had the public hearing, addressed all of the school committee questions, and based upon all of that, we did not make any changes. So everything you saw throughout the process has stayed the same. I know that was one question, was to explain any differences, so I get a check for that one. The first item I did want to point people out to is to start with a high-level overview of the budget. So on page, hopefully my pages are, are the same. On page nine, it's figure two, which is expenditure by cost center. Um, this shows the budget broken down by the five cost centers that we report our expenses on. So just as a quick brief overview, um, the school committee has five cost centers. The school committee itself votes each town. cost center. Town meeting votes the bottom line. We can transfer funds within each individual cost center, but any money movement between the cost centers does go through school committee approval, so you'll see any of those happen throughout the year. I'm gonna let Chuck call to order, right? Need to call us to order? Uh, call the school committee to order. <laughs> the school's committee budget is within the guidance that was provided by the finance committee and reflects an overall increase of 3.5%, so it is a balanced budget that we did bring forth to the superintendent to the school committee and now the school committee to the finance committee. <clears throat> when looking at this chart, the one number that does jump out at people is the administration cost center, which shows a 10.2% increase. That reflects the 1.0 FTE that was added as a community priority. So one of the items that came up, which I believe was presented to FinCom earlier on, was that there was $60,000 allocated to the schools to add a 1.0 FTE, which is a split HR payroll position. That is within the administration cost center. <coughs> Excluding that addition, the cost center would have had a 4.7% increase. So we did want to level set that one a little bit for folks. The next item if you look at figure seven on page 15 is another breakdown that we typically show folks is how the general fund expenses break down by specific category, professional salaries, 
clerical salaries, other salaries, contract services, supplies and materials, as well as other expenses. As we have discussed each year, professional salaries comprise the largest percent of the budget at 69.2. Salaries as a whole, if we add the clerical and other salaries, is 81.6. So the majority of our salary is of our budget is salary based, which makes sense since the biggest portion of the school's budget are the teachers and all of the supporting staff. The increase in the salaries that you see here reflect all of the contractual step and cost of living increases for the represented employees. We are in the final year of the contract, so from a budget standpoint, it makes it a little bit easier because we do already know all of the tables that everyone will be on. And then for any of the non-represented, we have included a COLA increase. So just so folks know that the FTE I talked about before is within the clerical salaries line. So that is why that line item is up 9.2%. If we exclude the add to staff, it's up 2.4%. So it would be normalized without that. Just to give a little bit, I know we were asked to level set a little bit, but just to give folks an idea what makes up the categories. The professional salaries include salaries of our administrators, department directors, teachers, and specialists. The clerical salaries include the central office administrative staff, um, building and department secretaries make up that line. The other salaries would be our paraprofessionals, custodians, as well as any substitutes that we have. Contract services includes items such as legal, <coughs> transportation, as well as the cleaning contract within the facilities cost center. The supplies and materials would be where curriculum material, technology, classroom supplies, and software reside. Other expenses include special education tuition, postage, dues, membership, professional development, and translation services. Just to give you a sense of what makes up each of the items. On that same page, on figure six, we also include a year-over-year -year percentage change for each of the cost centers so that individuals can see how we are trending year over year because we often get asked that question. Within, on pages five and six within the budget book, we have listed out the majority of the budget drivers for this year, um, which are pretty consistent year over year. It does include, as we mentioned, all of the contractual increases for our represented individuals. We do include all of our known out of district tuition and transportation as well as placeholders for items. We are trending that we don't know definitively if they will result in an out of district, but we're currently working through the process. So we do have amounts that we put in there as placeholders because each year we do see we have individuals that do end up in out of district placement. So we always make sure we budget something for that. Um, we do have funding for curriculum upgrades that we're working on, social studies for the new social studies curriculum. Chris Kelly and I are working on that currently. I think I saw an email today on some of that. So we do have placeholders for that as well as um, foreign language, algebra one that we're currently working on. We do often get asked if we already have the numbers for those items. We do not, as we're currently still vetting a lot of the curriculum materials. So we have money set aside in the budget for, we typically were working with the vendors throughout the year to pilot programs, look at everything, working with the teachers. So as we get them, we report back during regular school committee meetings as to how we're progressing with it. Um, there is the new dyslexia screener for early elementary students, which is a new requirement for next year. So we also know we will have that to fund as well. We're piling in a program this year that we received a grant for. Um, and then at the bottom of page five and onto page six, we also have listed out our FTE changes, which are not significant this year. We have net addition of, because a lot of them, before I say it's a 0.54 FTE, we do have four people. These are positions where we had 
not full-time FTEs that we've increased hours based upon looking at the needs of the students in the various programs. So it added up to a net addition of 0.54 paraeducators, 1.6 special education teachers and related service, related service providers, and then the 1.0 payroll HR person. We also did have slight decreases in two areas. We had, we previously had a rentals coordinator who left at the end of last year. We have been able to reassign responsibilities to other individuals, so we did not end up backfilling that position. And we also had our data coach, who we still have the same data coach has gone back to school. She has reduced her workload, so she is still here, but she went from a full-time employee down to a .6 employee. So we reallocated dollars associated with that to various technology platforms. So those were all of the salary items. And usually what we also say is we, when we're preparing the budget, we'd like to remind people that we're about six months into the current year, so we still have six months left of this year when we're preparing the budget because we're preparing it in December to present it in January. So we're six months before next year starts, so we're a good 18 months before the end of the next fiscal year. So this is based upon items we know today. There are always chances that you have an increase in <coughs> student enrollment. You could have changes in homeless students, which really for us is more displaced students where if, unfortunately, we did see recently if a fire occurs in town that the family gets displaced, we transport the children back into Reading, so that can become a significant cost depending as situations change. We also could have an influx of Eng English language learners, and there are also instances in which we have an increase in special education related costs, either students moving in, bringing students into or out of district. So there are just a lot of unknowns that 18 months in advance we don't necessarily know. We work closely as a central office team and we do update school committee throughout the year if there are any significant changes. Miguel, to that point, because I know how dynamic it is, as, as it's also pointed out, <coughs> you said some of these hires had to be this year, like in special education. Yes. But you're still comfortable with tracking. I'm sure you're tracking constantly. You're still comfortable for FY20. Yes, we are. We have been. We're doing another projection now. We did one when we updated the budget, and we are comfortable with that. As mentioned, um, and we did talk about earlier in the process, and this is an instance where we actually did bring, um, we did transfer funds to cover the position this year. We are adding the HR payroll person. We were very fortunate, I'll stay this even though Bob's not here tonight, that we have shared a resource with the town for the past several years where the town, it was a town employee and we had that person two days a week, the town had three days a week. He left um, back in October, oh, yeah. so at that point we sat down with Bob and Judy and Matt, um, John and I and Jen Allard, and really looked at all of the roles and responsibilities that the towns and the schools were facing, and we made the decision that it made much more sense for the town to hire a full-time person and the schools to hire a full-time person. So we are actively recruiting for that position now, so we did add it in the current year. <coughs> and. It was funded as a community priority for next year. It's just that area is becoming more and more complex with all of the rules and requirements. And also as we look to do a lot more in the realm of diversity, we just realized with a half-time payroll, half-time HR person, it just was no longer sustainable. So this, we're excited that we have this opportunity moving forward. I think the other area that um, within the budget that we do always talk about are the revolving funds. It's always hard to give a high, quick level overview. But this year we have made, as we do each year, we always assess the revolving funds to look at the enrollment, look at the revenues that's coming in, looking at the costs of the various programs. And each year you will see or I would, I would say you should see increases or decreases in the various offsets that we take. 
So to step back quickly, the way that the each revolving fund can work a little bit differently, but each revolving fund is set up for a specific purpose based upon the revenues in the programs that are being run. So we have the extended day revolving account, which is for our pre before school and after school programs where we are charging a fee for the students to attend. The majority of the expenses for that program are directly charged to the revolving account. So all of the staff and everything we have go directly against it. We take what is called an offset, which is always fun to. Right, so they're sort of standalone. It's a standalone entity account. that gets set up and approved. They all have rules and requirements through um, the DOR that says how the revenue works, what you can charge for expenses. Um, and then there are instances in which for some of these we take what we call an offset where we look at the expenses that are happening within the operating account. So for extended day, our custodians are cleaning. They're here early to get the buildings open. They're cleaning the spaces. They stay after the school day. And um, so we take an offset for that. We take an offset that actually goes to the town. And what we mean by that is we take money from the revolving account, so we decrease the revolving account and basically increase the operating funds because we take it into the operating accounts. So we take an offset that goes to the town that is to cover some of the maintenance of the buildings because that's handled by the town as well as electricity, water, heat, and items such as that. We also take an offset for the administrative office because the function does report up through Chris Kelly, um, the payroll department, HR department, my department spend a good amount of time between payroll, accounts payable, accounts receivable. This year we did a lot with um, procurement. We do a lot with <coughs> HR because there's a lot of hiring that goes on there. So we did increase the offset slightly looking at the amount of time that the central office is spending on it. So that's the type of analysis that we typically do. We also look at the accounts such as the extracurricular <coughs> accounts we have, which I'll say extracurricular as well as athletics. We have a fee-based program where students pay a user fee to participate in extracurricular, which I sometimes will call drama, but it is. More than that. <laughs> it's more than that. Um, so I've, I've trained myself on that one. And we also have what I will call gate receipts. So revenues we receive from people who buy tickets to the games, people who buy tickets to the shows. Oftentimes for the re extracurricular, the band, the, um, when they're doing set builds for the shows, those items come directly out of the revolving accounts themselves. We do take a, another offset into the operating account, which is meant to cover the stipends we pay out of the operating accounts to pay for all of the people involved in putting on and producing the shows as well as all of the athletic coaches. So we do look at those each year, I will say. This year we are looking at it again because a decision was made when Anna Wentland came on as the new department head that we have gone from four shows to three shows. So we're looking at what the potential impact is on user fees as well as receipts from the shows to determine whether or not we may or may not need to adjust the offset going forward. It's a little bit tough because it's just happening this year, so we don't have a full year of data. But last year we did reduce the athletics as well as the extracurricular revolving account offsets because we also were not certain whether or not late start would have an impact on any of them. So there's a lot of activity that goes on. So this year we have slightly increased the offsets based upon what we've seen trending to date on that. We also have the RISE as well as full day kindergarten, which are paid programs, which is a similar, we, the money goes into a revolving account. We take an offset out of the revolving account to cover the staffing associated with those programs. And that is an area where we have started to go through each of the revolving accounts and look at all of the sources of revenue how much we're getting in, what the, how many students are in the program, whether we have free and reduced, and then looking at the expenses to make sure we are matching revenue and expenses. So we've started to go through, and when we look at it, it also involves community ed, driver's ed, so there's a lot of 
subsets within them. So hopefully that covers the high level. Yeah, it answered to do an overview because I do think that concept <coughs> comes up every year and it's, it's sort of a challenging one. So I do have a quick question. Stuff. You mentioned um, as, a, as a related, oh yeah, sorry. Um, you did mention as it related to um, the use of the, like, is there a, uh, um, a you know, a DOR, um, you know, kind of offset, depending on how you get the revenue, like versus, you know, ticket sales versus like a tuition payment. Is there, is there any, is, is it all just kind of lumped into the revolving account and then there's no, um, you know, discrepancies that you need to make for that? Or is it just once it's in, it's, that's what governs it? It depends on the revolving account. So for um, the athletics, you are able to use the, because the gate receipts are going to help support the program, but there are for each of the accounts requirements that the money in is supposed to equal the money out, which is how you're supposed to, to set your fees. So for like kindergarten, if we get donations, it would go into the operating account, not to a revolving account, because really all that's going in there is the fees we're receiving. So it is very specific okay. by program. And we can't commingle yeah. them, so I'm not able to say my, I always pick on extended day because that's the one that is probably one of our healthier ones because we just keep having such an increase in it. I can't use extended day funds to pay for a set build for a show. That you, the money in has to be used for the purpose it was collected. If that helps with that. No, and then and then you mentioned too, like um, as the as your process of like allocating the administrative fees. Has that been something that you've had to kind of fine tune over time, just with kind of more just transparency as far as understanding? It might have just been sucked up before because that's just what you did. Now you need to, you know, kind of have a little more transparency to make sure that you're allocating it out to the revolving. And that's what's been happening, as Chris knows, I've actually been tracking with her to say how much time are you spending, like when you're meeting with the director of extended day, how much time are you taking? I work with. HR and payroll to say, you know, on a pay period, how much is extended day compared to not extended day? So I'm now trying to actually get at that granularity level for sort of the over, uh, the, those of us who are overhead. I do the same with special ed where we tuition students in. So I look at not just the cost of the student, but I know um, Dr. Styes and her assistant have to spend time assessing whether the, it it's a good fit for the student. We have to send them invoices. We chase them for invoices. We process the receipts. So sure. it, it's an art more than a science, but as an accountant, I'm trying to make it a science. <laughs> no. Well, I'm sure technology helps with that a little bit, but then how does, what, what's, so can you just kind of walk me through a little bit of sort of when, what's the, the knock on effect of that? Does that end up, because I'm, I'm, I'm not smart enough to process it, but does that end up you um, draining the revol the offset of the, the revolving account more, you know. So then now that that there's more expense that's tied to that because of the offset, and so then the revolving account doesn't carry as much from year to year. Mm -hmm. Is that how it works? It is. And okay. the part that we always caution folks is, right now we are we did increase the extended day because we have seen with this year. I don't know how much folks are aware we had a waiting list anyone was aware um, so we spent a good amount of time myself Chris working with the extended day folks to put a procurement package out to go out to bid to get external vendors to come in to help us so we've been spending a good amount of more time this year than we had in the past so we are increasing the offset this year I would caution that in future years once we have trained up the staff within the extended day we're there doing more of this we would then have to decrease the offset which is where you have the opposite flip where i have to fund more out of the operating account than the revolving account so that is why we do look at it each year so you don't end up with a giant cliff where you built it up so much that you can't support it anymore gotcha thank you all right now i imagine you almost have to leave some contingency in there for the end yeah. yes it seems like there should be a really complex but an algorithm to figure out what those offsets and should be. And that's what we're but, working towards. And yeah. the other part that does get tricky, which a lot of folks I would say, especially when I'm looking at some of the accounts such as 
community ed, our summer school kids camp program, use of school property where there is a lag where you may pay expenses before you have the revenue come in because this is not a billable, billable event. So say somebody was renting this space today, I have to wait until I have the cost, the room rental, the custodian fee, I've incurred the expense because I have to pay everyone, I'm not going to get the revenue until a couple of months down the road. So there is always that concept of having several months of expenses covered within the revolving account because of that lag. The, the other thing that Gail, Gail's being modest is, uh, I mean, in, it's been budget years where I'll say we robbed Peter to mm -hmm. pay Paul, yep. where we've, we've been uh, aggressive in use of offsets. And you know, since Gail's been here, we've been very judicious about it. And, and you know, that's that we, I think we got criticism from our auditors yeah, for, for so. Yeah, four years ago. Yeah. So the, the concept is if I have done the analysis and I've come up with what the offset is, regardless of, you don't want to use the offset if you need it in your operating fund. If, if that's what the offset is justified, that's the offset that should be taken. You shouldn't build up the money in the revolving account because that's not what the funds were determined to do, so. Any other questions about revolving accounts and offsets? I probably do, but I'm gonna hold them, yeah. The other area that we did want to give a quick update, which we did provide during the budget, was we did receive questions about Turf 2. So we are very happy to let folks know, as we did during the school committee presentations, that the Turf 2 project has been completed. The Turf, I know, very the turf will be opening mid-March, which is March right 16th, around March yeah. 16th for the spring sports. It looks, if people have not seen it, it came out it looks great. It came out amazing. Um, not only did they do a great job, we had a great group working on it. We also came in $402,000 below budget just based upon the competitive nature of the bids working very closely with the consultants. So we were also very happy that it came out as well as it did and we were able to turn some of the capital money back over to free cash. With maintenance. Hmm? With maintenance. With maintenance. And yes, nice, and nice <coughs> new windscreen. I like those <laughs> rockets on them. I don't believe the number of meetings it took to determine the windscreen. <laughs> and then the other, um, Bob did ask me to just give, which um, we'll be doing a more formal presentation at the end of March for school committee, that we are also still working on the modular classrooms for Birch Meadow that we were very fortunate to get the funding at November Town Meeting. So we have prepared, the bids did go out. We have had the site visits. We met with DRT, the design review team, team. which is made up of DPW, police, fire, administrative services, I think, Facilities. Facilities, anyone concerned with conservation. There was a very large room full of people. So we met last week. We were all set. They didn't have any issues or concerns because we had presented them with all the information ahead of time. The bids are due next week on the 5th, so we will be opening those. So by the end of March, we're hopeful that we'll be able to announce where we ended up with it. There are two parts of the bid. We do have the modular piece, and then we will be doing a traditional Chapter 30B for anyone who likes the MCPPO side of the world to do the furniture fixtures technology. So that's much more of a traditional easy bid. So we are in the process of pulling that together as well. But we still feel we had the pre-site walkthrough, which we had three bidders show up, which we also took that as a positive to show that there is some competition and we're still comfortable with the timeline that everything will be up and established prior to the start of school. We'll also have communications that will go yep. out to the community because it will impact a little bit of extended school year, summer camps, the why because some of the playgrounds will be blocked off so we'll be making sure we have all of the communications frequently going out ahead of time and throughout the process. So we're looking forward to that. Great. 
That's everything we had. That's my 50,000 foot view. So, um, thank you, first off. I appreciate it. I've gone to the past few um, school committee meetings. I have a few questions. Um, and if you don't know the answer, you can just say, I don't know. Um, 2030, as a monetary value, where are you trending right now and where do you see the budget for fiscal 2030? And I say this as um, it's kind of a loaded question because we don't know what the community is going to be. Um, but based upon what you're trending now um, from year to year, or even the past, I'll go past four years, um, where do you see yourself in 10 years for budgetary? I would love to be honest and say we have savvy enough I mean, I'm savvy enough, savvy enough equipment to project 10 years out into the future. I will say that next year our bus contract is up. Next year our collective bargaining agreements are up. So I typically have not had the ability to go out 10 years into the future to try to predict three to four collective bargaining agreements, three to four bus contracts. We're, mm -hmm. Right now we tend to be a little bit more two to three year versus the, the 10 year is just not something we've had the capacity to build out a model that looks that far into the future. Okay. Um, so, so part of the reason I ask that is based upon what, where we were in fiscal FY17 to where we're projecting to 2021 um, is an 8.9 million difference from 2017 to 2021. Um, and so even though we are at the 3.5% balanced budget, 3.5% as that number continues to increase, mm -hmm. that dollar value will continue, inevitably continue to <laughs> go up um, so we don't know about new construction and we know there's all these other variables but based upon that um, for a continual increase of um, expense um, I heard some of the practices it sounded like that are going on for making analysis for um, cost savings or trying to eliminate some of those um, revolving accounts or rollover accounts um, one of the items that I noticed the largest difference in four years is other expenses um, across the board. Um, is there a further broken down, you know, SOV or line item for not just the narrative, but um, kind of a cost? There is within. With let me see if I can find the within the other expenses. I will say the largest, as I look at poor Jen, one of the largest items within that is our special education out of district tuition which can okay. fluctuate significantly year over year and that is within that line item what I would say has been the largest okay. driver of the increases which is if I were to put it and feel free to jump in there are several drivers on that and I will I I'll try to answer a question I'm gonna guess is going to come up either from FinCom or um, we have been trying to address this question with school committee as well so within that number we have the out-of-district tuition, which in and of itself is a little bit of a challenge just based upon the nature of what it is, the population that makes it up where tuitions themselves increase annually. Sometimes it's based upon what's called the OSD rate, which is sort of the inflationary rate which is set. Each private school also has the ability to come forth and ask for a raise originally it was sort of every three years but there is a concept out there that if they need immediate emergency relief based upon their cost going up they can go to the state and ask for approval sometimes you find out ahead of time sometimes you find out they've approved it today it's effective immediately today we have seen significant increases in some of those schools upwards of in excess of 10 percent where suddenly here's our new fee structure if you have students going there and we while we can attend the hearings, we don't necessarily have the ability to fight, if that's the right word. So what we've also seen oftentimes is changes in the types of placement. Now, this is an area we cannot necessarily go too deep into it based upon um, obviously the nature of, of what it is. But if you have a, we always strive for the least restrictive environment, but there are instances in which Unfortunately, the least restrictive may be a residential type placement where 
one year you may be spending fifty to sixty thousand dollars for a student the next year that same student could be costing you six figures if there if there's a change in placement we also have the transportation aspect that's based upon the number of students on a bus going to a location so that's always a bit of a wild card the one area we're hopeful we're just getting more information now which does appear to be positive is the circuit breaker funding which is probably the one offset we don't talk a lot about because it's actually built into our budget is we do receive what's called circuit breaker reimbursement not an electrical circuit breaker that we receive funding from the state for reimbursement of special education costs so years gone by it was always funded at close to 75 percent that dipped down into the 60s for a while um, with the new budget that has been passed they are now pretty much targeting to fund that at 75 percent so that is a positive for us the other part that they have just added is they will also start reimbursing transportation that is getting phased in over a four-year period 25 percent this year 50 75 100 what's a little misleading is it's 75 of the hundred not a hundred if people hear the hundred percent and think you get a hundred percent but it's 75 percent of that so um, Jen and I were just at a meeting a couple of weeks ago with um, the Department of Education walking through how they believe these calculations are going <coughs> to happen so we're getting more information so that will be a positive so we're hopeful that those two items will help mm -hmm. that number to decrease the part about the circuit breaker is it's very dependent upon your claims and it's a year in arrears so if you have an increase in special ed your circuit breaker may go up but it'll be a year in the future if your special education goes down which is a positive item your circuit breaker will go down so it's sort of that double-edged sword the other positive that we have been able to attain is we actually have a year in reserve so we're using last year's circuit breaker this year so we're able to budget fact certain whereas a lot of districts who have not been able to get to that model budget an assumption they don't know what their numbers are going to be nor do they know the funding so it's always a bit of a gamble we're fortunate that we're able with working with Bob to budget fact certain so that's why some of these numbers are a little bit more difficult yep um, to continue on the special education talk um, so the special education number has gone up significantly <coughs> as well and I'm only basing this off of four years is because the majority of the tables on here are four years um, but if you look at the enrollment and IEPs, those have actually decreased. Um, so I, I'm sure curriculum has changed and required state requirement has changed. Um, so a lot of the questions I'm asking is, um, what conscious efforts are we taking to make sure we sustain? Yep. Um, because at the school, at several of the school committees, there's many things that we want and there's many things that we need. So there's, there's always gonna be desirables and we're always gonna want more and more and more. Um, but eventually we have to say we're sustaining certain facets of the budget um, and improving others um, Continuing to improve or increase the budget will eventually, you know, uh, push us out financially, so um, You answered the majority of what I had I have one more question I did notice we have a percentage and a um, amount given back for free cash each year um, that percentage is uh, very close to your budgeted item so you guys accuracy seems to be really really on point um, almost too much on point um, so the question would be uh, as far as line item SOV that you guys are creating for recommended budget to actual spending um, do you guys have a comparison of any historical year like 2017 what you requested and how you actually spent it by line item by line item we do we actually are required to report to Desi yes on an annual basis with the end of year report so we do have that and we do report to at a, at a higher level at the cost center level to school committee at the close of each fiscal year by cost center yep. budgeted requested versus actual spent and then we break it down of how much of that was salary compared to expenses so we do do that report that we give to school committee on 
an annual basis. And I, are we can we get any of that by going to, no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, no, I, I only ask because I'd be committee. curious because I know a school committee has has the ability to um, <coughs> request yeah. you know mm -hmm. reallocation on a on a light item. So I'd, I'd just be curious uh, yeah, how we it was. Yeah, we can. Um, we actually do. I think I had started it by 2017, the final year end memo that does break it out by cost center, oh, yeah. by category, yeah. and by um, cost center. So we can send you each of the, the 17, 18, and 19. We do have those memos. Okay, great. That are, um, yep. I was going to look for Linda, who's not. I'll do it. Lin I got Lin it. I got Linda, it. Linda's going to take it. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> horrible and it is it would be on the school it's in the school it's actually the packets, packets too, on the website that was really bad I from like each year <laughs> Andrew or yes, sir. Paul you don't mind oh go right um, we're just, not as formal as <laughs> <laughs> just to answer uh, first to address a, a point and Dr. Doherty or, or maybe Ms. Stice can do it as well but while we've seen IEPs go down and some costs go up from the in district, right? Some of that's mandated by services. You can't level, you can't just say I'm gonna level service this, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's it's what's required for that student or those set, that set of students. I would argue, and I think we can have this conversation going into the next year, we actually wanna raise that number so we can reduce the out of district number, right? That's the number we don't have as much control over. If we're able to raise the internal number not proportionally, we'll save a significant amount of out-of-district number. If you go back and look at the first override documents, for example, it's about half the cost to educate internally versus ex ex educating externally. And so if we can close that gap, we can save from a financial perspective. That's one thing, right? So we could see more go up on the line item from internal teachers, but hopefully, if we do it well, save on the out-of-district. Out now, there's obviously, as has been stated, there's some kids we have no way that we can potentially do. And again, as the team decides, that will be what the team does. But if we're able to make some movements there, we can make some positive progress and control some costs. The other thing is, fancy computer here, um, fiscal 14 to fiscal 21, the average growth rate was 3.97%. If you input that using the numbers here, using fiscal 21 and forecasting forward, obviously with the point that Ms. Dowd raised that we don't know what's going to happen, but just using the seven years, right. you're looking at FY30 of being 68.73 million. Right. So, yep. using those growth rates. I know, and to your point about special ed, because I know I have the same concerns as I brought up in the meeting, I never question that we're not doing everything we can to control that, and I want that to be clear. And so I'll go one step further and say, also, any programs we can do, especially early on, to identify these students in yep. regular ed before they even need an IEP. Yep. So I can speak for myself, but I'm sure the whole board, we would support that. So I think, you know, the more we can highlight those kind of programs yes. and fund them, yes. we're all behind it. And mm -hmm. that's the kind of stuff we'd, we'd love to see because and this is staggering mm -hmm. <laughs> when you look at sort of the decreasing requirement of students and the increasing cost. Not only that, it's the right thing to do, right? Absolutely. That's the other thing about Absolutely. it. It's the right thing to do for the kids, mm -hmm. for the families, and it does hopefully and improve it out, help financially. Yeah. And one of the items we do, which is probably one of the biggest part, obviously with 82% of the budget being salary driven, I would say where we spend the majority of our time and the majority of our time throughout the year is assessing the staffing needs. So as students are moving, we actually now, and I, so this is the accountant, this is the left side of the, the table. So we actually track the cohorts of the students as they're moving so that we're actually saying, okay, we have this group of students moving from this grade to this grade, this school to this school. We have this group coming up. So we're looking at pre-K all the way to 12 to our post program as we're sitting down doing the budgets and I have to give Jen credit, she's done a great job of going into every meeting with these are the students coming in, these are the programs, these are the needs, these are the schedules. So we're assessing the staffing and we're not just adding to add, we've, we've shifted. You'll see sometimes in here you may say 
numbers go down at an elementary but go up at the middle school is because as the students are moving, we're tracking and trending and making sure the resources are going where they need to go. So each time requests come in, it's a, it's a full analysis that happens that we're looking at the right level, which is why this year you saw a lot of the related services adds to staff happen because that's where we're seeing the services are needed. So it's the OT, the PT, PT. the speech that we're adding. So it's a very well thought out plan that we have that we are doing exactly that to say are we when we're adding it, is it at the right places throughout the spectrum? Honestly, right. <laughs> right. It's, right. It's and, at but that I level. also you know, I and from listening to some of the pr the work you're doing, I think we've got a really good blend between sort of that tactical and st strategic, you know, look at um, meeting the students' needs today, but also in the future. And I do think this is a cycle that tends to happen. You know, it wasn't that long ago we got the override, and so typically you're in that crunch, and you're getting higher class sizes, and you're not giving this you know, students quite the services that we know they deserve. So then you pay the fiddler for a couple of years. And I do, I do feel like that's what you see in these big 10-year cycles as you get tighter and tighter on the budgets that then, then the first couple of years of getting that override money, you're sort of paying for the squeeze from the previous years. And I feel like that's what we're seeing too. Um, perfect segue. Um, <clears throat> so, and it does, and I completely agree that keeping it in-house, like time and time again, is always very cost efficient. Um, what the community like feels like they're getting surprised with, I think, is the the school space issues that crop, creep up on us. I didn't know if you guys have any way of predicting that in the future, because yep, you're going to build these great programs and you're going to support the kids in the district, and then the programs need specialized space is what I'm hearing which is a big difference from 2000. I think the tough part about that and I'll start and then obviously switch off to those who will be probably a little bit more eloquent with it. So we we have done that. That was probably one of the largest pieces we've done and I think it's a little bit tougher. I know Linda and I have had a couple of conversations like this where you can go out. We've done an enrollment study that looks at and again left left brain live births trending them through so you can somewhat predict with certainty based upon looking at what's happening here, what's happening statewide, what, hap what happens in New England, what happens across the country as far as what they deem live birth. So what, how many children are people typically having? What are the move-in rates where you have districts where there is an aging population that is moving out and a younger population moving in? Those tend to be a little bit easier numbers because mathematically you can come up with an equation that if the actuaries love this, this is what they do. You spit it in, you grow it, you spit it out. I think the tougher part is to predict, if I don't say this right, it's a lot more difficult to try to predict with accuracy the level of the programmatic, student the, the, the student programmatic needs. needs. I didn't, yeah. this is not going to come out right. It's a lot more difficult. I think what also gets tricky is one of the items we have heard and have seen throughout a lot of these is students are living a lot longer, which is great. So previously, even 10 years ago, students who are now in the school systems would not have either lived long enough or been put mainstream into school systems. So that is also a relatively newer phenomenal than my parents sort of generation. I think. I think what also tends to happen is the dynamics of the community and depending on the makeup of the community, you may see different populations as well. So it's a little bit tougher of a number to truly get your hands around as well as the types and needs of the students. So as much as we've attempted to predict that, with everything we've done, we have made assumptions to say based upon what we've seen, based upon what we've seen trending, we feel we will need X or Y space at each of the schools for the program. I so that, that has been part of what we're doing. Right. For how many years out? I think that any anybody that was paying attention to that when we went to town meeting, it was yeah. the 
enrollment was never part of the dialogue with the space. It was it was Correct. programmatic. Correct. That's so, why I'm asking. Okay. What can we do so, so that the community so. says the, the this is the community says the students aren't going up. Why do we need a new school? So, so I'm saying, what can we do to get ahead of that and explain it? So I started bringing this up as a problem in 2010, and I have the documentation. I'm sure Tom can find it right now. <laughs> um, I made presentations at town meeting. I made presentations at school committee that we were seeing uh, enrollment is one piece, and our enrollment is either stayed flat or decreased a little bit. Yep. But the two other big drivers has been your, actually three drivers, your special education programs and preschool, integrated preschool, and your full-day kindergarten. Mm -hmm. and when full day kindergarten first started in 2005, I believe it was like 25% of the kindergarten population was in full day. We're now up to 90%. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is something that our community needs <coughs> and, and wants. So that obviously has used up you know, the classroom space. The special education programs, we've gone from one to nine programs in the district. Mm -hmm. That uses space, mm -hmm. it does, it's the right thing to do, as Tom said earlier. Um, it, it keeps your costs lower financially from sending students out of district. Um, so those drivers, you know, are what are causing the space crunch. No, I understand. I, I, I'm, the, the thing I'm struggling with is that, um, So it's easy, it is easier to add staff and the students you don't have control over. You, you do what you can do and you can add the programming, but the, the building and the classroom space, you can't respond that quickly unless you put down modulars. So that's... Right. Yeah. Well, so, so Karen, to that point, I mean, maybe one way to start um, thinking about it or representing it is, could you illustratively say the delta between an average in-district and an average out-of-school district placement is, you know, X dollars, whatever it is. Here's, here's how many sort of student years of space you have to get out of a modular to pay for a modular. It's not that many, probably, right? You know, you're probably talking about somewhere in the order of, you know, 10 or 12 years of what I'll call student years. So if you've got you know, six students being served by that space, it's paid for itself in two years by bringing up, you know, by bringing a program in district, for instance. So, um, you know, just as an example, there probably are some creative ways to think about, because I like where you're going, Karen, is getting ahead of that, that pushback that always comes, um, because these space needs are often driven by the programmatic requirements as opposed to enrollment. So, Sean, back in 2017, that was a $20,000 difference? Yeah. Now we're probably talking thirty or thirty-five thousand dollar difference. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Right. So if we're going to spend your, your payback is like two years. Yeah. If we're going to spend <laughs> four fifty on a modular and yeah, yeah. I mean it, it pays for itself quickly. Yeah. A year or two yep. years. Yep. Yep. And you know I know we're not building the modulars to house students on IEPs, <laughs> right? You. I know that. That's right. Right. yeah. We should. We should. We <laughs> always. You know, we have to say that every time. But uh, you know, but we are building. We are bringing in modulars to accommodate the space required in the buildings for students on IEPs. And you know, on some respect. Still a good investment. Right. 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 But I mean, the other point that Karen's raising is really the the forward-looking approach, and that's that's really what the building study was for. Right. Right. To try to do that. Now, to what Gail's trying to say is, we can't predict. How many kids that come in are going to have autism? How many kids are going to have Downs? How many kids are going to have dyslexia? That's that's not predictable. I mean, there are some regular statistics that are out there. Dyslexia could be five to seventeen percent. You know, those are the ones I'm closest to, so I know. But there's others that you could say maybe it's three percent this, four percent that. But even that, you can't really predict within the community size that we have. So you have to respond, right? We can choose to react as a, as a community and yell and scream about it, or we can choose to respond as a community and figure out how best to serve our children, our families, and the overall community as it is. Early on, 
so that we can avoid some of that special ed process if we can by doing some really early prevention and direct instruction. So is, is, is that piece, like, is that relatively new or like? New this year. New this year, okay. Can I ask one more quick question? This might just be a yes or no. Did you guys do um, a classroom utilization matrix? Like, what is this? How often are classrooms available? And I, I'm not, there's no judgment here. I'm just like. No, but I, the question was, do you have, just, uh, just statistics, do you guys maintain classroom yeah. utilization? Yeah. So they keep track of what classrooms are available when, yeah. because a lot of those services take place in classrooms when the class aren't there. So for instance, like there aren't, it used to be downtime, like if kids were in music, that class was just empty or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Where For all the specials. When you walk around the buildings, you see so little of that now. Because when they're at art, somebody else is in that room. No, I had heard some feedback to the contrary, but that's just like one person's observation and maybe it was a weird yeah, guess. That's what I'm asking. Part of what we were doing when we did the whole um, master planning space study is we actually met with all of the building principals, the four of us met where we actually were going through and realizing how tight the space was, especially I think oftentimes people think of the traditional classroom not all of the specials that are going on where you have the OTPT speech where they have to have space and you have different groups coming in and out of there so if you went in there would there be someone in there rock solid for seven hours on a day it depends on the group of children in the specials and how they're happening but we building by building room by room laid out every room and what was being which was where the modular conversation came out because we looked at the worst of the worst solutions because there were no open spaces that could be used all day of do we come forth and ask for the modulars or do we go to I'm sorry, art on a cart do we take away gymnasiums do we take away Library. auditoriums do we take Pieces away libraries, libraries? Yeah. and based upon the utilization in all the buildings the only way we could free up space is to start to take away some of the common spaces. So we, we have done that. Which is what we, what brought us to the decision for the, the modules. To the modules, yeah. Because we were going to have to use we the stage at Birch Meadow. That. I mean, it was, yeah. there was different options there. So what's the next milestone for the element, elementary space project? Because these are good questions that we could save for that. So the, the plan moving forward, because we, wanted to get through budget season and mm -hmm. uh, obviously now we have an election next week and is to start uh, having more community uh, information sessions where we present the different options that that were made uh, by GNAP and then get feedback on that um, we have some time because the next window for MSBA uh, to do the letter of intent is until next January so that that's the plan at this point is to move forward with that we also the school committee is going to need to make a decision on which option and then they would hand that over to the PBC mm -hmm. so based upon the timing the thought process behind it was this really needed to be a well thought out and get the all of the right constituents involved so to try to do it over a one to two month time period All we right. realized we would not be able to get school committee community involvement PBC and everyone so we're going to take a very methodical approach so are we doing some of that in the spring or is all for the fall? yeah it would because yes it would start in the spring yeah so spring and, and go into the fall stuff then. great thanks yeah I have um I have a series of unrelated questions, or they're unrelated to each other anyway. Um, so, uh, you know, most folks in the room probably know that Mrs. Dowd's going to be leaving, you know, going to be leaving the school system, um, which is unfortunate for a number of reasons. Um, uh, but I do have a question related to the budget on that. So the, the placeholder for, for her position in 21 is for 153 and change or something along those lines. And I know that the, the position posted is uh, the salary range is 110 to 140. Yep. 
um, would it be appropriate then for us to consider, uh, you know, re addressing or uh, reducing the budget to, you know, to make up some of that gap? To, to do what? I'm sorry. The so the the budget the budget includes funding for one a placeholder of 153.470 for the the director of finance right, position. Right. But to do what with the remainder? I well, no, no. What I'm saying is we presumably are going to pay our next director of finance somewhere between 110 and 140 per the posted. I hope. Per the okay, <laughs> okay, yeah. So that, that's what I was asking is, you know, would that be an opportunity for us to for for us to amend the budget? You know, for instance, um, given that we. For expect the, that that for, will come in. for the finance committee to amend the budget or for 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 well for town meeting technically but yeah so there's there's a couple of I, I don't know if you've noticed but we've already changed it from in, the original posting oh I mean I'm looking at the Ted K 12 correct posting that's live correct, now because yeah. when we originally posted the position it was for a business manager yep um, we yep. had a lower salary range and we did not receive any application viable applications okay so we decided to change the title change the salary range which was still within the budget that we have for next year we don't know yet what we're going to get for a pool so let's assume we we are able to hire a director of finance um, if that person is coming into the district and they have less experience we are required to give them a mentor mentor is going to cost um, money to do. So we would be taking the delta from the 153, 140, whatever's uh, been allocated to provide for mentorship. You also have to make sure that you have professional development available. Sure. Um, a lot of times beyond what currently, um, you know, the current, uh, you know, position is using. So w those factors need to be taken into account. Now, if for some reason we aren't able to hire, um, and we ran into this last year with the Director of Student Services, um, that we had, we were fortunate that we were able to have Sharon Stewart come in for a year, but when you bring in someone that's retired, um, it will cost you more money. Sure. Um, so I would recommend to the school committee that they would leave that salary right where it is. Sure. Fair. Yeah, okay. And we're not we're not talking about. I mean, we're, what are we talking about? Ten thousand dollars. Thirteen. Yeah. Thirteen thousand uh, dollars. Yeah, I'm not I'm so, not saying it's going to change the game for the town. That would just go back financial to free future cash or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Fair. Okay. Uh, the second question that I had um, there was a there was a reference in the responses to the school committee questions, and I think you mentioned it in one of the February meetings as well about a meeting with state. Uh, state leaders around Chapter 70. I'm assuming there wasn't great news that came out of that, otherwise we would have heard about it by now. So we, no news. this is what gets tricky about having these meetings before we have school committee meetings. So, welcome to finance committee <laughs> meeting. So we did have a meeting with Senator Lewis. Um, you have to be a little bit careful how we, great news did not come out of that meeting. So for those who love the Chapter 70 formula, the way that it actually works is it gets calculated each year and then there's the concept of the foundation budget so there are those communities that may or may not be at foundation that will always be brought up to foundation so they may have increases in their funding each year. Reading is in a different situation that we are actually above foundation. So as has been pointed out by several neighboring communities, we actually receive more than mathematically the formula would dictate that you would. But what happens each year is we get the foundation budget and then what they call the hold harmless, which is about $30, $30 per student. student. So we are already so far above the foundation budget that even if we go to full day K, we ran the numbers, we met with Senator Lewis, Desi ran the numbers it has no impact at all if we switch to full day kindergarten because we are already so far above the foundation budget that it is not going to impact the calculation. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think we probably expected that part going yeah. in, right? That, that was, I mean, it's like a $3 million we'll delta, if I'm not mistaken. The, yeah. the question yeah. we had been receiving is why are other surrounding communities getting a bump? It's because they are right. at foundation budget right. and adding that student population bumps them up so that they get additional funding, whereas our, the level we're receiving from the state, and it, it is because of how the formula works, and it's 
they're not going to come back and get money, but it is something that we are already so far above it that it doesn't matter, whereas some of the neighboring communities, Andover was not above foundation. So when they were able to go to full day kindergarten and phased it in, they were able to get additional Chapter 70 funding based upon the mathematical Chapter 70. And this um, is the new formula, right? Yeah. Which hasn't yeah. really changed much. <laughs> I mean, the new formula didn't change a lot. It, did, it didn't change much. It, it didn't. Not for I, I know there was an article that said we well, got a 1% increase, but that was over last year's number, not a 1% above what we would have yeah. anticipated. Right. So right. we were hoping for a 2 to a 2.5% two increase over last year. We got 1% over yeah, I mean, last year. The, the new law, I mean, in our case, we don't have a lot of low-income students. We don't have a lot of English as second language students. We, I mean, that's that's where the the money was adjusted, they right? It was going into those yeah. major categories. Thirty-three cities, towns, right? Uh, of the three hundred and two towns, only thirty-three really saw a significant adjustment. And in Andover's particular case, you know, I know, I know you've looked at it a little bit. I've looked at it More quite a, a bit, bit as well, yep. right? I mean, they're they got about half of their half of their one. 1.1 million comes from one thing, the fact that their town growth is less than where they are, yep. than what they're expected to be, yep. from, a, from a foundation budget perspective. Yep. The town was less. And and so do we know the, that disconnect between the foundation and budget and what we're receiving is that related to like a previous switch in the formula? Do we I mean do we have any kind of institutional knowledge on how that happened? My my understanding is it happened around 2007 eight. Okay. Um, and since then. We've been getting what, what as Gail called it, the whole time amount, yeah. which is it. Sometimes it's 25, sometimes it's 30. Right now, with the new law, it's 30. Okay. Um, uh, then, then my my third question was um, last year. I think in these same meetings, um, one of the things that I asked of, of you guys was. Um, you know, we look at budgets from a year-to-year -year basis. We're trying to sort of solve for a number that, you know, FinCom has guided to and, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, it doesn't necessarily always allow us to sort of invest in things that might have, you know, what you'd call an ROI, right, from a medium to long-term perspective. John's looking at you like he knew this was coming. Um, <laughs> and so uh, last year, some of the things that you highlighted were uh, grant writers, um, additional uh, counseling support, I think, in, uh, particularly in the early grades, uh, and full-day kindergarten was, was another one on that list. Stay tuned for so, the next school committee meeting. <laughs> so um, part of this new law, this uh, student, the new act, is that all school districts are required to submit three-year plans by April 1st. Um, and so what I decided to do uh, to put together a draft and begin to show it to the community, which is now going to happen during the month of March, is not only talk about what we're doing in FY21, but what could we do in 22 and 23. Um, so it's like looking forward. So some of the things that I put into the looking forward, um, and I'm, this is more visionary, it was the full day kindergarten, was to eliminate the Wednesdays at the elementary um, and for additional guidance and counseling services pre-K to 12. Okay, so those things hold as, as priorities, right? Yep. Um, one of the, one of the uh, conversations I expect that this committee will have over this series of budget, uh, budget meetings is we've got a really healthy free cash position. Um, you know, I might argue it's it's too healthy uh, for you know in some in some respects, um, and so we may have discussions about you know how to think about uh, making investments in that free cash, whether it's performance contracting or other things. Um, given what you just said about expressing these priorities in that three-year plan, um, is there anything is there anything that the town could do now from a budgeting perspective or from an investment perspective that would support that case or put us in a better, you know, on a better footing um, with respect to some of those things that you're highlighting in that plan. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wish list. This is, feels like the time to talk about it. <laughs> I, you know, I, I the, the biggest drivers, the, the, you've got the long-term investments you need to make are in things like your curriculum and instruction, building your tier, what's called <clears throat> tier one. So, and we're doing that. You'll notice in this budget that we've bumped up our curriculum 
and professional development line items. That's done purposefully so that we can continue to invest in our teachers, continue to invest in our curriculum, um, continue to invest in our technology so that we can stay on pace uh, to keep those, those moving. The more we can build the toolkits for the teachers, the more that they're able to instruct all students. Um, in theory, that reduces the, uh, your percentage of special education students because you catch them catch those needs earlier and in you know the pre-k to two so that's a big investment that we've been working on now um, for the for the last actually since the override is probably the best way to put it um, you know the other pieces that I mentioned earlier to you are the other pieces of the investment that you know I would say we would need to make and you know that the counseling tutoring guidance piece uh, which was one of those those components is is, is huge um, eliminating the Wednesdays at the elementary so that um, the students are going five full days of school and so th and that doesn't mean the teachers aren't going to get their their necessary planning time it means that it's reallocated differently throughout the five days instead of just on the Wednesday right. so you need additional staffing to do that but you provide more opportunities for students because now that's an additional two hours in their day so those are the types of investments that and I think what we talked about mm -hmm. before, some of those investments are not necessarily the one-time investments. Once they're there, you would, it's an ongoing, right. permanent addition to it. So I think that's where some of the compensation gets a little bit trickier <coughs> because I sort of look at it as sort of the modulars, one-time great investment gets us a lot of space. We're sort of, hopefully, don't quote me, one and done. On those, whereas if you the other items which are very much have a great return on investment, but once you do it, that's a cost that becomes part of the base and grows going forward. And so it's not necessarily a one-time use. And of before cash all of those becomes a collective bargaining agreement, <laughs> that, <laughs> that, and I'm not I'm not being a wise guy. That's no, going to be right. a difficult. Difficult road. It's fair. Thank you. Anything else? I just. I, I do believe, actually, uh, Dr. Darkstar, I'm pretty sure you mentioned last school committee about some desirables, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that we want to see maybe next year's um, fiscal budget. Um, I can't remember them specifically off well, the top of my head, but I don't think. would be there. So the kindergarten would be there. Yeah. I mean, I don't know about next year, and it wasn't just mentioned again, but so. I think that that's definitely on our, sorry? That's an item that I think we would look to do a phased in of sort yeah. of how do we do that with reducing tuition, reducing, that's the, op, that's the flip side of the offsets, is reducing the tuition, reducing the offset, which increased the operating budget and how do we do that over a realistic three to five year period time period yeah. okay. <clears throat> anything else and I do want to commend all of you again for you know the budget books and especially when you compare it to other communities because often one of my parents um, I sort of they still stay in tune with what's going on and Believe me, most communities don't even do it close to this. And Gail, you will be greatly missed. Thank you. And we want to really thank you for all the tremendous and extremely dedicated service. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Agreed. So thank you. We've got a couple other agenda items that will continue. But thank you. We want to motion to adjourn. adjourn. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Good. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. You get to stick around. I wonder if we should read to stick around. make it more yeah. 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 easier yeah. conversation. Yeah. Hello down there, Mark. <laughs> like three of us could swing around. I can't. Yeah, yeah we're okay. That's, yeah, yeah right. it's fine. And then maybe just going with these three times? <clears throat> I think we're all right. We're all right. We'll talk loudly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll speak loudly. Okay. Okay. Which, which, which is fine, but I really am having trouble down there. So, well, we'll wait for these guys. We'll take it quick. Yeah. <laughs> Mark can project. Yes. Oh, if they do need one, I can let them in. Jack, did you
Did we have minutes attached to the? They were in the front packet. Oh, okay. <coughs> I think they might okay. describe it that way. I don't know if so I'm wrong. So I'm losing it. Huh. Oh, maybe I didn't. Oh, I know. You're a short time, but I was very sad. Separately, I just realized what I printed. I love that you talk all the business, but you really understand what happens in the school. I try, and you don't see that. We're still technically live and in session, right? So, um, no, I know. That's. I'm just. Yeah. Um, I think it's an. Oh, uh, just to, yeah, I wasn't moving on to the new item. But yeah, um, so the, um, you know, my perspective on this is that over time, you know, people will talk about spend within your means, like the two and a half percent, you know, kind of threshold there. Um, over time on our controllables, we spend within our means, both on the town and the school side. It right. really is special education and health care have historically been the two things that, you know, make our budget, you know, break through that, that kind of threshold. So. Um, but you're right, all the condos in the world aren't going to get us to 4% revenue growth, no. you know, over a 10-year period. And unless so. we build uh, the Linfield Market in the middle of Reading, I don't, <laughs> I don't foresee us <laughs> being able to afford a $75 you know, million dollar, a um, operating budget. You. you have this many stores, you'll generate this much revenue. That's why that's we've got to the, save, guys. Hmm? That's why we've got to invest now to save. Yeah, right, yep. exactly. I mean, that's... So, and with, with potential large projects potentially coming up yep. um, on top of increased budget costs that'll um, a lot of things need to happen now in my opinion but well and that's sooner why we, than later. we tend to see that the two and a half percent is very constraining so we have to see an adjustment every yeah couple of decades yeah yeah did you get does she have copies for you yeah yeah she did okay. thank you but we'll, we'll so now it's, now it's at least quieter so we can move on to i know you wanted to talk about that so our current policy now is to use five percent of the budget for debt and capital and that really came out of, um, it's so bad when you lose 10 years. It's about 2004. Yeah, so in the early 2000s, we really didn't have that policy and we were trying to also fund so much um, of the capital within the tax levy. So we really drove ourselves into the ground both for, and from a free cash perspective and from just a planning perspective. So. Once we put that policy in place, we realized we were getting to the projects. It's so easy to not to, or cut that right off the bat. So when you start investing in that kind of stuff, then you go into it planning-wise and you're not like driving down some of your capital needs for when it's convenient, which is what had happened. Right. Yeah, and, and you know, Bob will tell you that um, that investment over time has meant that we're saving you know, some untold hundreds of thousands of dollars on maintenance every year because we're, we're appropriately investing in capital. Um, so I started thinking about this um, back in probably October-ish at one of our meetings. Um, and folks may remember, um, we were looking at the, the capital plan that was gonna go before town meeting in November. Um, and there was a discussion that almost felt like we had to sort of hunt for something to pull into the FY21 uh, portion of the capital plan to get to that 5% threshold. And so I started thinking about it and I was like, well, how could that possibly be? How could we be struggling to spend, you know, our, our, our debt yeah. and capital plan, right? Um, and then I started thinking about it. And if you, um, if you assume that 5% was the right number back in 2004, when, which is I think when that, this policy was pa first passed, um, it doesn't mean that 5% is the right number forever, right? And so I started thinking about, well, what would the dynamics be um, that would get you to a place where the, the number had uh, sort of gone out of whack with the realities of our budget? And so the, the page that I think everybody has in front of you, um, I, I was hesitant to send out the Excel because I... I feel like it leads to a certain conclusion. I th thought that might feel like deliberation, so I didn't want to send it out. Um, but I, I think I can send it after the fact anyway, uh, or ask, you know, ask Jackie to send it um, after the fact. But um, th this is just a printout from an Excel, and, and those yellow fields are intended to be assumptions. Um, but if you think about it, you know, there are basically uh, two factors that influence the buying power or the change in buying power over time of our debt and capital spend. One is how quickly is our budget growing, right? If our budget grows by three and a quarter percent per year, which is, you know, roughly, uh, roughly in the range of what it has been over the last, say, eight to ten years, um, uh, then our debt and capital expenditures, or debt and capital hold anyway, um, grows by three and a quarter percent per year. The second piece of it is what is the what is what are the appropriate price indices for the things that we buy with our debt and capital budget? So, 
um, you can see on the right hand side here, I just, I kind of just did a search for some PPI categories um, that felt like they were sort of relevant to the types of things we buy with debt and capital. So parts for construction machinery and equipment, HVAC and commercial re and refri commercial refrigeration equipment, heavy duty truck manufacturing, which includes things like, you know, uh, work trucks and fire trucks and things like that. Um, automobile, light truck and utility. So all the other vehicles that we purchase for the town, um, non-residential plumbing, heating and AC contractors. So there's a labor component there for a lot of these projects that we do, a lot of these projects that we fund as well. Um, and so, you know, you'll, you'll see the you'll see kind of the result there. Um, what I did is I went back and looked at 2004, December 2004, just because that was the year this was passed to December of 19 to eliminate any seasonality. And if you look at how the price indices have changed over those 15 year spans, um, there's an asterisk on that fifth one, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, if you look at how those price indices have changed over those 15 year spans, the cost of these things, you know, kind of on a national level at least, is not going up by anywhere close to three and a quarter percent over that same time frame. And so um, uh, the asterisk on that fifth one is that uh, I think there's only t uh, nine years of data available. That, in that index didn't start until 2010, so it's only based on nine years of data. I guess that's one that surprised me. I would have thought that was a lot higher. Uh, yeah, I mean, because of cost of construction, it <laughs> seems yeah, like it's really. Alone, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. So, sense, yeah. yeah. So, um, are these just was this just labor or is this a lot. building costs? That that the fifth one. So the fifth one specifically is labor. Labor. So the other labor four material. primarily are hard costs, our equipment. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and look, the reality is most of our projects have a mix of, a mix of all of these things, right? So, you know, it was, I just tried to take a span of a few different things just to give a sense. There was, there was no cherry picking here. It was literally the first five things I, I found that seemed to fit. Um, but if you take those five and you were just to do a simple average, you'd get somewhere around 2.05%, I think it is. But let's drop the lowest one. Let's drop that light vehicle one, which, you know, is cars and trucks, which haven't gotten that much more expensive over time, um, it turns out. Um, if you drop that one, you get to about 2.4%, which is what I dropped into the model here. So um, if you look at the left-hand side then, what this represents is if you start with a base budget year, year zero, and you assume that we were able to buy 100 what I call debt and capital units, right? So these are widgets. widgets. They don't represent anything in particular. They're just, you know, uh, just, a, just kind of an index to start with. Um, and then you apply a 3.25% CAGR to the, to the budget side and a 2.4% CAGR to the expense side you see how the, the ability to buy more widgets grows over time. And so now 15 years later, if these are the right numbers, we have 13% more buying power than we did in 04 from a debt and capital perspective. And that I think is what actually gets us to this place where we are hunting for things to pull into the capital plan. It's no longer, it's no longer serving the purpose it was intended for, which is to make sure we spend enough and we're not, you know, uh, you know, um, taking money out of that to support operating expenses and things like that. Um, we've gotten to a point where the floor is operating in kind of a different way and, and, and getting to a different result. And so my thought was this might be a time for us to think about, uh, think about revising our debt and capital policy and adjusting it to something like 4.5%, 4 percent, 4 and 3 quarter percent, um, and, and maybe even also uh, referencing in the policy specifically that we should sort of review this every five years and have the FinCom committee take a feel on, on um, uh, you know, whether the, whatever that threshold we set is, is appropriate. Um, as, as you all know, I mean, the, the policy is a, it's a minimum, right? It's a floor. So, so if there's a year where we do need to spend 5% or five and a quarter percent, you know, percent, we have the capacity to do that, of course. Um, but I think the policy may be, may have sort of lost its effectiveness in terms of what it was intended to do. It still does that, but it does something more that's kind of an unintended side effect. Right, because you're, right, you're concerned that you start to squeeze the operating. Yeah, well, yeah, and, it, yeah. and I mean, that's, you know. But yeah. it's also a little bit of a nice lever, which we've used in years, right. that recent was, years, that, that we say, oh, you know what? We're actually feeling pretty comfortable. <coughs> We're going to make it four and three quarters this year yep. in order to provide more to the operating yeah. budget. So it's also a lever we can play with, so we don't want to lose that flexibility for setting ourselves up in the other way. It's a lot harder to say, you know what, we think we need 5% this yeah. year. And, um, but this is all very valid, and we definitely have been talking about that, whether, five, you know, 5 was just a number. Yep. Whether that's... We yeah, I, and, I, and I hear the point that it's nice to have the lever that you can pull if you need to free up a quarter million or something, you know, whatever. Um, I guess what I, would, what, I would, what I would suggest, though, is that... Um, I think it is appropriate for this policy to get us back to a place where there's at least a little bit of tension, a little bit of some real trade-off discussions, 
can we afford to do that this year or not? You know, is it appropriate to push it out a year? What's that going to do to our maintenance costs? And I, I feel like we don't find ourselves having to have those conversations very often anymore. Mm -hmm. um, we mm -hmm. essentially, you know, outside of excluded, uh, outside of excluded debt, which is obviously a different conversation, from an included debt perspective, um, we're in a pretty comfortable place, and uh, I, I would argue it's maybe a little bit too comfortable. So, um, yeah. right, and it is projected 10 years out, so it's not like we're only focused on one year. Right. We're still feeling comfortable 10 years out. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. I think so, it's a valid discussion. I, I, this, to me, Bob, lends a lot of value to this discussion, so it would be nice yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Rediscuss it. Is it you, you just brought this up as a topic for discussion. Yeah, you I didn't. I didn't realize Bob. Decision. I didn't realize Bob wasn't going to be here. So. Yeah, I was yeah. That, that I would love <laughs> so, to hear more. Yeah. Look what Sean put on the agenda. Yeah. I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is more of a town budget item, anyways, and the next meeting, I would hope. I think. Well, this isn't actually. I mean, this is a separate agenda item from our right. budget discussion. So. Yeah. Sean, can I ask Which, one, yeah. one other question? What do you, you I, I hear your categories that you pulled. They make a lot of sense. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not crazy. What, I guess, as a group, what else, what else is missing from that that, you know, we can think of as a group that we may be missing kind of that I, could skew the numbers? I think It seems like the right categories. I think so, too. I am surprised what you made show. Yeah. Because yeah. well, it seems like those things are going up more than that. But yeah. well, I'm it's, not it's, that on Well, you know, I, I think we often hear that they are because you know year over year there's significant fluctuations right you know uh, some of these things are highly dependent on commodity prices right and and you know steel is very expensive right now so we just heard that our police cars were more expensive than I think it was a police car um, was much more expensive than we thought it was going to be in the previous version of the capital plan for example right, right? Yeah. so right. Um, you know but that's a that's a that's a seasonal blip or an annual blip versus a trend over time which is what I think a policy should focus on versus, right, you know, exactly. versus an annual budget decision. No, I like it. You had a good yeah, yeah, I just wanted to throw that around. Do we think we're, do you think yeah. we have the right model even to work with? And it sounds it's, like we do. Uh, it matches inflation. Yeah. Well, inflation is 2.5%. Sure. We're at 2.4. In theory, everything matches. What was the just experience in October and sort of the hunting for those dollars? I think we landed on the performance contracting, but is that, was that an outlier or has that has been? Um, I, you know, at least in the years that I've been on the committee or probably a couple years before where I was paying close attention, yeah. I didn't feel a ton of tension in terms of can we squeeze things, you know, squeeze things that are appropriate into the included debt piece. Um, um, but, you know, I, I would, you know, I mean, Paula and Mark, I mean, you were the only ones that were around kind of before I was. No, I agree. Region. I feel like there's almost an imbalance of tension. If yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. There's always tension in the operating budget. And now I don't feel the tension. That's right. It is going to create some of that. So no, I think it's good discussion. I like the lo I think this is sound logic. Yeah. Because, right, anytime if you're paying if your increases less than what your budget's going to be increasing, mm -hmm. it is going to get you more widgets. Yeah. And do you need them? It's sort of the opposite of the health care problem. <laughs> yeah. So, the capital plan are like ball fields and um, school space studies, things that were like well, consulting study studies. Itself. Um, so, yeah, so we didn't fund the school space study out of debt and capital. I don't think. I think we. I mean, we funded it out of free cash, but it I wasn't in the capital plan. Like it's on the bottom. Yeah, but I. Oh, that's, that's a solution to right. Is that what you mean? That's to what the capital plan. Right, but that's the solution to what this study ends up recommending. That's then you're probably looking it's at what's on the plan. No, but no so, dollars on it. No, it has the school space. So, but no, no, but your, I mean, your point could be that, you know, in some instances there's like consulting work, for instance, as a category. What? In some instances there might be like consulting work as a category. Yes, that's what I'm wondering yeah. if whether yeah. we need to just add something to this. Or what are the other kind of things that yeah. are on the plan? I'm not sure that BLS publishes a PPI for um, field space consult or field studies or <laughs> we, we'd have to find something similar, you know, or something at least well, as a proxy. Well, there's probably a consulting index. I'm sure yeah, I just, it, it, um, but does that get professional oh. sources? Yeah, I'm trying to remember if it was actually included well, I always in that think 5%. of capital plan as just being like widget driven, and then I look down and I go, oh yeah, down the bottom we got ball field, and we got we have consulting down there. Oh. The bottom. Yeah, oh. yeah. So, so one of the, one of the things that you mentioned, Sean, though, is that because the there was you know kind of a base assumption that the plant's kind of working, and and that's a, a current thing given. Bob and folks that are in there, is there any concern about, okay, well, what happens, 
you know, when Bob moves on, and again, I'm not, not, not advocating anything because Bob's not here to defend himself, but what <laughs> happens if there's He a, will retire someday. He will retire yeah. someday. Yeah. And so, you know, um, and I think, you know, that we're, you know, in a great place because of his stewardship. And so, you know, our, and again, it may be, that might be the other piece that, you know, kind of introduces the tension that, that that's needed, but it, are we overcorrecting because of just a question? I mean, that's you know, I mean, yeah. that was the that yeah, was yeah. kind of the, one of the assumptions yeah, that you made so. that that's kind of covered. What happens when that's not? Well, I I mean, or if it's not, you know, I would think if we still had a if we still had a healthy floor of you know four and a half percent, four and three quarter percent, something yeah. in that range, any town manager theoretically would still, you know, focus on the right things from a, from a debt and capital plan perspective, right? You know, with, with the guidance of FinCom and the school committee and, and town meeting and all that, right? So, um, uh, you know, I, I, think, I, think the, I think the policy itself has a ton of merit and it does protect us against somebody who budgets differently and less conservatively and with less of an eye towards the future, I think for sure. Um, I just still think you'd get that out of a policy that had a small, a lower floor. Yeah, and I yeah. just, I, I just, Wanted to kind of make sure that we're you know, yeah, accounted right. for that yep. assumption. Yeah. So, based upon <clears throat> some of the um, some of the things we know and discussions we know that are going to come up this year um, for future projects, right? Um, is this something that we want to address now or potentially bring up later, based upon those future discussions we're going to have in the next few months? Well, the the one reason why I would be I don't know if now means tonight or like as no, part of the budget now process. The, you know, in the yeah. Near future. Right? Um, the one reason why I would be, um, why I would encourage this committee, um, you know, a future version of this committee, I may have to come back in like a resident capacity and 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 plead with you all to think about this again. Um, is um, a lot more operating budget. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, it, you know, but the one reason I would consider, you know, encourage this committee to think about it as part of this budget process is that. Um, I view it as somewhat connected to this use of free cash discussion because, you know, Gail was making the point that um, a lot of these things that we're talking about that are priorities are not one year, right. you know, not one year expenses. Right. And so it may be appropriate for us to say, you know what, we think in FY21 we should fund $250,000 towards, you know, these three things across town and schools, whatever it is. You know, it's, it's an incremental reduction in the, the tuition for full day K or it's two guidance counselors or it's something on the town side, you know, whatever those right. things are. Um, uh, and maybe free cash is the mechanism to do it at April town meeting um, with an eye that we have identified a path through a, a reduction to the debt and capital plan in future years or an, an adjustment to it in future years as a result of this policy um, that makes that uh, incremental revenue that the free cash would replace next year sustainable in future years. So that, that's why I would suggest that we, you know, at least attempt uh, to, you know, to if we're going to move on this, to try and do it as part of this budget season, it doesn't have to be. But um, there is FY twenty one or twenty two. Uh, no, no, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we change the debt and capital oh, plan gotcha. for next year. Gotcha. Okay. I'm just saying that in advance of. I'm, I'm just saying that for, in, in advance of preparing for twenty two, it, it would provide us with yeah. more options. If we're going to have a discussion about things to invest in for free cash. Mm -hmm. The optionality gets broader if we feel like we have a path towards making those investments sustainable versus just a one-time free cash expense. Yep. Is my point, right? Because right? yeah. Yeah. our options, are, our options for one times, our are, performance are, contracting, are, are, you know? yeah, our, yeah, yeah, our studies. Yeah. You know what I mean? Sure, yeah, they're, exactly. they're one-time expenses. They're one-time things yeah. versus something that, again, is uh, I think even Tom mentioned it, these things are investments over right. time. Because for obvious reasons, you know, uh, the school department would be reluctant to go hire guidance counselors knowing that that funding may not be there next year. And I, and I think that's that I think that's the piece of it that it would be great to have Bob's yes. yeah. you know kind of feedback on that piece of it. He's like, you know, if he's managing to that, you know, like okay, well then that that does allow us, you know, you know, uh, you know that ability to be able to now look at and, and, and broaden that spectrum of saying, okay, yes. Now now we can think about uh, you know in his way of, you know, kind of managing that to be able to account for something that's going to be ongoing, you know, reoccurring. I hear the tension argument, to be honest. But um, uh, beyond that, I'm struggling to have the real advantage of this. So, to, to say, okay, that we're going to get a bank for a buck. But I think Bob may shed some light on that for that, me. That, and I, I don't think it's not happening. I think, that, I think that can happen. I think he just needs to tell me, yeah, I'm struggling with this. 
Yeah. You know, it, right, because Bob's been the first one to bring it up too. Yeah, saying, and, you know, and that's. Should be, we're looking at this. Yeah. Yep. But I'm, but also it doesn't make to m my thinking it doesn't make it more sustainable. It's a one-time baseline change. Right. It's not unless you're viewing it as the percentage goes from five to four point nine to four point eight. You know, otherwise to me it's just a one-time. Oh, sorry. Yeah, bump. but what, what I'm suggesting it makes sustainable yeah. is um, so it, hypothetically. Yeah. If we were to adjust the policy. And say it's it's um, applicable to FY22, the, the debt and capital plan during the FY22 budget season and beyond, right? Because the ship has probably yeah. sailed for 4. us to. 4.75. Yeah, 4.75, right? Um, you would be cre you would be creating 250k in your operating budget baseline, yeah. right? Um, what I'm suggesting is that the reason that that's relevant right now is because when we have a conversation about whether or not to use additional free cash this year for something in the FY21 budget, mm -hmm. it, open, it potentially opens up the use of free cash for things that are not one-time expenses because you know that you also have a, a follow-on operating budget opportunity yep. in, in future years. Mm -hmm. I see. Right. Yep. It just isn't, it's not providing additional increases each year. It's right. It would, yeah. Be, it, and yeah. Le, again, unless yeah. we phased it in, you know, which I, I personally wouldn't suggest just because it's too complex too to, to explain right. Right. every year that you phase a little bit in. Um, well, but uh, I would think that, well, if everything increases, you would you potentially would need a another decrease in that percentage, right? Yeah. So it's after still, five years, right. it, it may yeah, be four so percent, and that's the review because it's based yeah, off I mean, the, right, the, the total number. We, that's what we probably don't want ourselves set ourselves up for is creating a decreasing amount if we don't feel that well, that's. No, well, it's a minimum, just, just, number one. Just set so. it and then, re, and then, but the, to the point to review it. To review it every five years to see if you do need a reduction yeah. or, you know, or an increase. Long it's been, let's yeah. feel every five, and then it could be just, nope. We've had, you know, we've had a couple knockout dragouts, and so we're going to keep it the same thing. And, yeah, I mean, and, if you if you if you believe these numbers, right, which are you know illustrative, of course, but if they are you know roughly representative of what's going on. Uh, a reduction to four and three quarter percent would mean uh, that's what a five percent that's about a five percent reduction in our debt and capital expenditure. Take five percent off of that 113 units there, and you're still at eight percent more buying power than we had mm -hmm. in 2004 mm -hmm. from a debt and capital perspective. Um, so you know if the trends continue and the the cost of these things continues to to not outpace our budget growth, then we are going to be in a, in the same position at some point in the future where that tension gets dissipated again. So as a caveat to that, my, my, my only issue would be um, to free up that cash, you will spend that cash, right? So if you say um, there's an additional 250000 regardless if they need it, they'll spend it, period. They'll find a home for it. That everyone, there's always going to be a desire. Well, I want this. This is where we want to be. They're going to get there, and then all of a sudden, they become the new end state saying, I want the next thing, right? So um, by decreasing, let's for your example, decreasing uh, the 5% to 4.75, freeing up, you know, 250K, and then throwing that in the operating costs, um, that might even get just allocated way before it comes, what are the de the true desirables that, that we want? Oh, we want additional uh, guidance counselors or so forth and so on. You know, so, like, how do, how do you guide um, that the desired intent is meant by reducing that percentage. I, I feel like that's hard to say, hey, I'm going to reduce the percentage based upon conversations of us saying this is the desirables we want, and then I'm going to free up the cash. I'm going to make sure it's used only for that. Well, I you think can't that, really do that. Well, I think, yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a valid point. But I think in the end, though, again, the, the, one of the initial catalysts is, you know, freeing up, you know, using free cash. Right. And then, but, but again, not that we're the decision as far as where it, where it goes, but I think it, it is, you know, to, to, to one of the last questions that, that, um, that Bob and Gail answered as far as, you know, their wish list. I mean, that's, that's where this kind of plays into mm -hmm. that part of it. If it's a shell game, then, you know, then, you know, that's, that's, you know, that's something right. completely different. But you, I think you have to provide from, you know, from at least my perspective, uh, the, the, the means in order to make good decisions um, and then, you know, and then at least have confidence that the folks that are in those positions make the decisions with the, with the, with what we're allocating. I agree with you. I'm just being devil's advocate. No, 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 so. it's perfect. That's, that's exactly what, <laughs> right, no, words, yeah. that, that's exactly you, what I mean, if we, if you left it in free cash, right, yeah, it's, you, then you could do what you're saying. You sort of a line item, okay, we want it spent on X. Here you go. Right. 
right? And and I hear your point. I mean, it is it is a different way to control. But you have to do that every year. Yep. And it closes the door on things that are not one-time expenses because the school committee will not go or the school department will not go hire guidance counselors with uncertainty about whether or not the town is is going to be willing to fund it the next year. Yeah. Right. Unless they ask for an increase in their operating budget, right? Well, yeah, but I mean that's that's sort of the point here, right? Is that we're we're marrying, a, you know, a, a current state um, opportunity slash issue with free cat or with free cash, with a, a potential, you know, for freed up revenue that could fund things going forward. Right. You know, and, and the I like the word tension use. I think that yeah. sort of demonstrates the point. Yeah. You want equal tension, right? Now. Right. So the question of what is the right amount of free cash keeps coming up over and over again. Um, so is this something that I should go off and like research and come back or is this something we could ask like Sharon to like look into for us or Bob? No, I, th I think we place on a future agenda and Bob okay. would be a critical piece to that. Yeah. Okay, so we'd ask him to maybe talk to us about I, that. Yeah, I do think it's important to, to get Bob's perspective and I don't know if he can bring in, you know, something from a third party to, to validate but um, not that I don't trust Bob but just as a, as a benchmark right um, because in the is, in the right? recent ratings report right where we got this you know stellar bond rating um, one of the things cited was a healthy free cash position and so you know uh, I'm not suggesting that our, our guidance of seven percent of the budget is a magic number or the right number you know I don't know what I don't know what those rate you know it's it's probably not they're not going to tell you it's you know Eight percent of your budget, or eleven percent of your well, budget. Sure won't. Right. Uh, right. We but often try and get it. But I, I suspect it's less than uh, the sixteen or seventeen percent of our budget that we're that we're at right now. So um, I'd like to know that because we, we are asking, and we should. Some be of able our to local say. communities a lot higher than that. Really. So, yeah. Well. Bloomington. Really? Wow. Early, you know, okay. Really yeah. Some of the communities that have the advantage of higher commercial, fifty percent commercial. Yeah. Also, Retail. you know what? They they participate in things like CPA. I mean. The, you know, that could be like a financial forum topic for us. Yeah. But I mean, we're leaving all those capital items that relate to fields, ball fields, could come off of there if we were participating in a program like that because that funds that kind of stuff. But that's a that's a community wide it's financed through a surcharge. Oh, the Community Preservation Act? Yep. Yeah. It's financed yeah. through a surcharge just at a summary level. That whatever funds the community puts in it, state matches it. And it's for historical ball fields preserve open spaces a variety of things it's yeah, a great website voted on it and it was super close and it was even close when there was a lot of financial pressure and that's the other question when's the next override coming well a way to keep and put that off is to look at these other programs that are out there that other 176 other communities are using is that more palatable like it doesn't have the O. it doesn't start with an O, but it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a surcharge but you get your matching funds like the whole Every time we do something, whether it's school building administration or the library grant, right? It's like we, we invest money to get money back. We got to be taking care of advantage of that. Anyway, uh, but we could do that at like a forum or something. That's kind of a big discussion. Yeah, that's more like a financial yeah. forum kind of discussion. As far as the tax levy goes, um, Sean, is that the, could we essentially use that similar concept with the reduction in the percentage? Yeah, you could. To offset the tax levy? You right? could, yeah. That's really Sluckman's decision. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It, it, right. It's Sluckman's decision. No, I know. It just yeah. as a suggestion yeah. or an, right. as an so idea. Right. To your point just, before, do we need to be? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, you could, you know, so we have to have a balanced budget, right? But you could balance a budget by reducing tax revenues. You could balance a budget by spending on something. You could balance a budget by using less free cash in the operating budget. There's, you know, any number of things you could do. Um, and, you know, certainly reducing the tax levy uh, is, one, is one of them, yeah. Um, and my understanding and I, I've asked this question enough times and I'm confident that it's true, although it doesn't feel right, is that reducing our levy in any one year doesn't impact the ceiling. It's yeah, that was new news to me. The ceiling right. still goes up 2.5%, even if we say only increase our levy by 1.5% in a given year, for instance, right? So You can make up for it. Yeah, you can, you can catch up later, so yeah. Yep. Even though people feel that way. I've asked... Paula can tell you we've asked this question of yes, Bob very directly multiple yeah. times, and that's that's that was new, that that's was what he says. But um, I think that average taxpayer can't appreciate that. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. Catch up. 
They'd notice. Yeah. Yeah. They'd well, go, what the yeah. heck right. is going on? That's right. the problem. Yep. And, and sort of politically, in a way, and it's when, a bit of a nightmare. And when you would put the catch-up into effect is when things are getting dire, and you'd yes. be following that catch-up with an override request very shortly thereafter, right? So, right. so, so, so it's difficult from a it is difficult from like a positioning right perspective. Do, yeah. It wouldn't. Yeah. Actually, the PR for that right thing wouldn't really be. Yeah. You're just kicking the can on that. But I do. I think that I think we should put this on future agenda. I think you know we've talked about it, but let's actually make it agenda item for a future meeting past the budget cycle. Um, because so what we've got coming up in terms of schedule is um, next week one half of the town budget, the following week the second half. I did ask for you know an actual presentation because even though we get the we get to see the selectmen's meetings and go to the selectmen's meeting, I think there's still value in seeing the presentation and being a group and getting mm -hmm. level set. Um, so anyway, yeah, we did ask that there be a formal presentation. Um, and the, if you were able to go or hear any of the selectmen's meetings, they were actually asking for a little bit more than the balanced budget, so by about $200,000. So what Bob would be presenting would be the balanced budget. Um, so that's the next two weeks and then that third week is to go through the warrant items um, and vote on those. So that's how the next three weeks lay out. Okay. Um, anything else come before the board other than going to the minutes? Can I peek? No. Okay, so let's turn to the minutes from, so it's just the one set. <laughs> So from November 6th, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, a while. I think they got pushed off because some of those meetings been. were long and we just said, oh, we'll just do them late, do it later. Do we, do we, Jackie, you may know, do we have to do minutes for the meetings we post where we attend somebody else's meeting? No, they okay. do those minutes. Okay. Um, do you folks right, and time? generally we weren't, we weren't called. Oh, we didn't have quorum right? in most cases, right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Do folks need time? Motion to approve the minutes of November 6th. Second. Questions, comments? All those in favor? 8-0. Anything else? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second.